As we continue our sermon series, Mission of the Kingdom, and looking at the Gospel of Luke in particular, today we look at the King's Prayer, also known as the Lord's Prayer. Chapter 11 of the Gospel of Luke, beginning in verse 1, we'll read through verse 13. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord... Teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. We ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. And he said to them, which of you has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, do not bother me. The door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, Yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And the grass withers and the flower fades, but know not the word of our Lord. It stands forever. Amen. You may be seated. Have you ever encountered someone and you were at a loss for words. I mean, somebody you really knew, you knew everything about them, Uh, maybe a celebrity, maybe a sports figure, but you knew everything about them and you're waiting for the moment to talk to them and the moment comes and you're absolutely at loss for words. You have no idea what to say. Well, whether we realize it or not, that's often how we can describe our relationship to God. We know a lot about God. We have fellowship with God through the context of community and fellowship and worship. But when it comes to our prayer lives, we have no idea what to say. We have no idea how to actually communicate to our God. And just as the disciples asked Jesus to pray, We too need to ask Jesus, teach us how to pray, teach us how to speak to God, teach us how to communicate to the God that we're told longs for us to communicate with him. It's interesting that Jesus gives his disciples this prayer This is a obviously a different version of the Lord's Prayer than we read about in the Gospel of Matthew. Certainly, Jesus didn't talk about prayer just once. Uh, But here is another example of the Lord's Prayer, the King's Prayer. How to pray before the King. And it's interesting, the place of the Lord's Prayer and the importance of the Lord's Prayer throughout church history. Uh, The great German reformer, Martin Luther, said this about the Lord's Prayer. He said, the Lord's prayer, because it arises from the Lord, is without question the highest, noblest, and best. For if he had known a better, the holy, faithful schoolmaster that he was, he would have taught us that also. There is on earth no nobler prayer to be found. It is the highest under the sun. It is a wall and bulwark of the church. I love that phrase, a wall and a bulwark of the church, a strong weapon for all godly Christians. A prayer above all prayers. So just as the disciples begged of Jesus 2,000 years ago, may we 
2,000 years later. Ask of the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, Lord, would you teach us how to pray? Two things I want us to look at in the context of studying Luke chapter 11. I want us to look at first the substance of prayer or what we are to pray. And then secondly, I want us to look at the confidence of prayer, how we are to pray, the substance of prayer and the confidence in prayer. In verses two, three, and four, Jesus himself gives us the substance of prayer, what we are to pray as his disciples. And you note that Jesus in this kingdom-centered prayer doesn't start with, this is how to ask for everything you have in need. He doesn't start with asking, but he starts with adoration. You see, all kingdom-centered prayers begin with the vertical before they go to the horizontal. It begins with adoration of God, the vertical dynamics of our relationship with God, before we go to the horizontal, before we ask things from God. So it begins the substance of all prayers, kingdom-centered prayers, with adoration. So how do we adore God? Well, first and most important, it says when you pray this in verse two, begin with Father. Father is the foundation of all kingdom-centered prayer because it asks the question, answers the question, who in the world are you praying to? Are you praying to an impersonal deity? Are you praying to a boss? Are you praying to the big man upstairs? It answers the question right off the bat, who we're actually praying to, and it serves as the foundation for all kingdom-centered prayer. No, you're not praying to an impersonal being, an impersonal boss, the man upstairs. You, in fact, are praying to God, the Father, God as Father, God as your Father, God as our Father. And we need to understand this phrase, Father, here, this term Father, is the most in intimate of titles. In the Greek, I'm sorry, the Aramaic, actually the phrase is Abba. It's the most intimate of phrases to communicate God. I mean, it could mean Daddy. It's our way of being so personal and so intimate as far as communicating our relationship to God. Daddy, Abba, Father. And you can imagine how shocking this was for Jews in the first century uh, to, to think that we would refer to God as Abba, to think that we would refer to God as Father was appalling and shocking in the first century particularly for a first century Jew. But this is what set apart Christianity from all other world religions. This is what has set apart Christianity from all other world views. And it's what communicates that Christianity is the only religion that is based upon grace alone. You see, all other religions, whether in the East or in the West, believe that prayer is a means of gaining favor with God, uh, gaining merit with God but not Christianity. We don't pray in order to gain God's favor. We pray to God because we already have his favor. We don't pray to God hoping that he will be our father. We pray to God because he already is our father. It is our reminder every single time we pray, our father, that this is a relationship. The only reason I am able to come to God and call him father is because of grace alone. It is the vertical reminder that grace comes down from God and that he becomes our father according to the unconditional grace and mercy of Jesus Christ alone by way of the cross. No other religion can offer this. No other religion can call you to name God in this fashion other than Christianity. The grace-based relationship that we have with God gives us access to God to call him our father. We will never understand the power of prayer until we understand the foundation of prayer, calling him father. So not only do we adore God and experience the vertical relationship with God as father, but it secondly tells us to hallow his name. 
What's the word hollow mean? The word hollow means holy. It means set apart. Well, that makes sense that we would recognize God as holy and set apart, but it says, hallowed be your name. How in the world is a name holy or a name hallowed? Well, we need to understand the context. A name in the first century is completely different than a name today. A name in the first century communicated value and it communicated character. Uh, Your name defined who you were. So this was Jesus's way of saying, hallowed be your character. Hallowed are you that you have a name that is above all names, that you are set apart, that your character and nature as God is unlike any other, that you are the God above all gods, that you are the king above all kings, that there is no God like you. We address him as father, but we address him as the name that is hollowed. You see, coming to God as Father is not a calling to come to Him in a cavalier fashion or a cavalier manner, but it is come to Him, yes, as Father, intimate and personal, but to come to Him with reverence and awe and wonder, saying your character and who you are in your being is unmatched and unparalleled. And you know what the problem is? The majority of prayer groups in the North American church don't spend a minute adoring God. They don't spend a minute hollowing his name. The unfortunate thing is the majority of North American prayer groups spend the majority of their time, if not all their time, asking. And there's nothing wrong with asking. We'll see that in a few moments. But not before we adore. We don't go to the horizontal until we first go to the vertical. And now you might say, pastor, the reason we, we go to the horizontal is because that's what's practical. I mean, when I pray, I wanna talk about my needs, my marriage, my children, my finances, my career. Listen to me, adoring God and hallowing his name is the most practical thing you can do in prayer. You say, how, pastor? Because hallowing the name of God is the one thing that is objective. It's the one thing that will never change. It's the one thing that's not fluid. What's a reality for you today in your life, in your marriage, with your home, with your children, with your finance, might not be a reality tomorrow. And the question is when your life gets turned upside down and things change in your life, what's the one thing that's immovable? What's one thing that's unshakable? The character and the nature of God. And so we need to be men and women in our prayer life that are so immersed in adoration of God so that when the seasons of change come into our life and the winds come into our life that want to blow us down, we are able to say our lives are unshakable, our lives are immovable because our lives are grounded and rooted in the character and nature of God. The most practical thing you can do in prayer is spending time adoring God and hallowing his name and adoring him and worshiping him for who he is. This is the pattern of kingdom-centered prayer. Adoration, our Father, hallowed be your name. But the second thing we pray is asking The horizontal relationship, always the pattern, first adoration, second asking. And Jesus says we can ask for four things. We can ask for your kingdom to come. We can ask for our daily bread. We can ask for forgiveness. And we can ask him to not lead us into temptation. Now we don't have time to cover all four things, but just briefly, daily bread. Now, the asking for daily bread reminds us that God is not just concerned with the big things in life, but everything matters to God. It's our way of being reminded that God even can, is concerned with providing for our daily physical needs. God's concerned with how our consciences would be clean. Daily asking for mercy, daily asking for pardon, for the forgiveness of sins. Third, asking that we would not be led into temptation. Notice that Jesus doesn't say remove temptation. Even Jesus was tempted. 
It's the temptations that make us stronger. It's the temptations that shape us into who we are. But don't lead us into temptation in such a way, Matthew clarifies this for us, that it wouldn't lead us to evil. So God, would you protect us? Would you provide for us? And would you forgive us? But I think it's important briefly to think about what it means in verse two when we're prayed to ask for the kingdom of God to come because this is so significant. Do you realize what Jesus is giving us the permission to do? He's asking us to take what often seems nebulous, what often seems distant, which often seems subjective, the kingdom of God, what often seems abstract and bring it into the reality of your present. Take something that seems far removed, the kingdom of God, and make it manifest in your daily life. Do you understand the privilege we have to ask Jesus for his kingdom to come? Where there is brokenness, Lord, would your kingdom come? Where there is strife and suffering, would your kingdom come? Where there is injustice, would your kingdom come? Where there is wrong, would your kingdom come? It is Jesus' way of saying, you are to be a co-laborer with the King of kings and Lord of lords to bring the reality of the kingdom into the present, to bring which seems abstract and far away and nebulous and pray that it would be manifest in your everyday life lives. Me made manifest in the horizontal. This is the substance of prayer. First vertical, adoration. Second horizontal, asking. But Jesus here in chapter 11 not only gives us the substance of prayer, what to pray, but secondly, he gives us the confidence. He tells us actually how we can pray. In verse, beginning in verse 5, Jesus gives us an incredible illustration I'm so grateful for this illustration because he actually tells us how we can boldly approach the throne. He tells us how we can pray and in what matter we can bring our prayers and our petitions before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It's interesting in verse eight, he uses a word that might be new to you, impudence. Who's ever heard of the word impudence before? Well, I think the NIV and the NASB do a great job of translating this word for us. In the NASB, impudence is translated um, shameless or shamelessness. The NIV goes a step further and says a shameless audacity. And you say, Jesus is calling us to a shameless audacity when we pray? Well, there's two clues here in the passage that speak to what it means to have a spirit of impudence or to have a shameless audacity when we pray. In verse five, Jesus says, imagine you have a friend that comes to you asking for three loaves. Well, for a first century Jew, this was rather audacious. It was custom at a feast to only have one loaf of bread for the family. You would take the loaf of bread and you would tear it into bite-sized pieces and dip it in all of the other entrees available. But you would never be audacious enough to ask for two loaves of bread, nevertheless, three loaves of bread. But this is communicating the abundance of grace and mercy and provision that awaits the children of God when they approach the Father's throne. But not only is it audacious to ask for three loaves of bread, Then Jesus goes on to say, and then imagine that you knock and knock and knock again. You ask and you seek and you knock. This is illustrating a man that will not give up. My children from the time they were little, even up to today, have always made it a tradition when walking up to my parents' home to ring the doorbell persistently until they answer over and over and over again. Sometimes it's not only the doorbell, but it is knocking at the door simultaneously. (laughs) And you go, how audacious. But listen to me, that is what Jesus is illustrating here. 
He is illustrating a little child walking up to the home of a father and persistently ringing the doorbell and persistently knocking. That is the shameless audacity and the confidence that we are called to have in the context of prayer. It is a picture of ascending intensity. It is persistently, shamelessly, with confidence, knocking on the door, believing this, God not only will hear me, but God will actually answer. This is the confidence that we have when we approach the Father's throne with boldness, with great expectations, because our God is a great God. And the reason you and I don't pray as much as we should is because our prayer lives are boring because we pray boring prayers. But if we actually believed that this is how we approach the Father's throne, it is with boldness and with confidence, knowing that we have a Father that hears us, a Father that will listen, and a Father that will answer. But it begs the question, how? How do people like us, timid people like us, have this type of confidence to pray in this manner what well, comes through the cross. You see, it was on the cross of Jesus Christ that Jesus had a moment of prayer. And there was a moment of prayer from Jesus on the cross where Jesus was not able to address God as Father. But we're actually told that was there a moment of prayer on the cross of Jesus Christ where Jesus, instead of praying Father, prayed this, my God, my God, why? Have you forsaken me? You see, it was at that moment on the cross where your sin and mine was put upon Jesus Christ that God the Father turned his face away from God the Son. And that is good news for you and me this morning. And it is the only reason we are able to boldly run to the Father's throne with such confidence because God was forsa- Jesus was forsaken by God the Father, we can live with the confidence that God will never be forsaken from us. This is the promise for all those that believe in Jesus Christ. Jesus was forsaken so that you and I would never be forsaken. And this alone, the power of the cross, is alone what gives you the power to pray with boldness, to pray with confidence, It will utterly transform your prayer life to know that you can pray with this type of confidence. But it's only for those that know Jesus, know that on the cross that he took their sin, that he took their guilt, that he took their shame. And in return, by faith alone, they receive the robes of righteousness that forever give you the promise that you are no longer an orphan, but forever a son forever a daughter of God, the Father. You see, the promise of the gospel is this. Jesus not only gives us access to God, but he gives us access to God, our Father. Recently, I was called to go pray with a gentleman in our community that was rushed to the trauma unit here in town. And I saw a man lying in a bed, struggling to live, fighting for his life. And in that moment of standing over this man fighting for his life, I prayed with such a sense of urgency. I prayed scripture over him. I shared with him the gospel. But it was in that moment that I understood I am praying as if this was a moment, a matter of life and death. For it was. But as I was leaving the hospital that night, I was convicted. And I said to myself, why don't I always pray like this? I mean, if I actually believe that prayer is part of the arsenal for the people of God to storm the gates of hell, if I believe that all life is a spiritual battle and not a battle against flesh and blood, then why am I not taking my marriage and my children and our community, and our nation, and our church before the throne of God with such confidence, praying as if it was a matter of life and death. This, brothers and sisters, is the call of prayer to the people of God, 
to storm the gates of hell in our prayer so that prayer becomes the arsenal for you, that you see prayer as part of the spiritual warfare to fight against evil, to fight against the evil one, and to usher in the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. Could you imagine if our prayer lives look like this? In our marriages and in our homes, in our community and for our nation and in our church. It was the great Prince of Preachers, Charles Spurgeon, who said, our prayer groups, we call them the boiler rooms for God. Oh, may God, a Coral Ridge Presbyterian church and all throughout South Florida, create and rise up boiler rooms for the kingdom of God, that in our prayers, we would storm the gates of hell for the sake of the kingdom. This is the king's prayer. This is the prayer of the king's people, sons and daughters, every day, storming the gates of hell. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, would you forgive us? Forgive us for praying small things. Forgive us for praying first for what we need and not for your name to be hallowed. Praying first for us and not first for your glory. Forgive us for praying small things with a little expectation. Renew in each one of us, if we belong to the Father, a spirit of confidence, a shameless audacity that we will ask and seek and knock as expectant children, expecting great things from a great God, not for our glory, but for your glory and the advancement of your kingdom. Would you create right here in this congregation boiler rooms for the kingdom of God, that we would be so on fire for God and for your kingdom, that we would understand the power and the effectiveness of men and women on their knees, pleading before the Father's throne. So would you restore a life of courageous and confidence, confident prayer for the advancement of your kingdom and for your glory? If there's anyone here this morning that doesn't understand what it means to be reconciled to God through Jesus, May they understand that they can have access to God as Father, not because of their goodness or their righteousness, but instead because of the goodness and righteousness of Jesus Christ. That God the Father was separated from God the Son so that you and I could live with the confidence that we would never be separated, never forsaken, always connected as a child no longer living as an orphan, but forever your son, forever your daughter, full access to the throne. May many today surrender their lives and forever live before God, God, their Father. We pray this in the matchless name of Jesus Christ. Amen.